I am both fascinated by and hostile to postmodernism, but I'm actually hostile to it from like a sympathetic viewpoint. <laughs> I find a lot of the analytic critiques of postmodernity actually kind of flaccid. Because they just don't read, right? They just don't have no tolerance for the style. And yeah, it, it you, seems you actually... almost like it's a stylistic, just not dealing with the concepts at hand. To really dig into any kind of um, continental philosophy past Heidegger, you have to deal with structuralism. And I know we barely got West to do this one. <laughs> we did? <laughs> I thought you were against this topic in general. I'm not against it. And I, because I've studied psychoanalysis, I've had to read this Sassur many times, and I've read a lot of Lacan. And yes, I can't. I hate Lacan with a passion, but there are some important ideas there. So, yeah. Do you blame Sassur for Lacan? No, I think Saussure did his own thing, and it's very insightful. And I think, you know, the uh, structuralists and post-structuralists did their own thing with Saussure. They're not just taking it whole cloth. They're making their modifications. So some would criticize the way they've interpreted or adapted Saussure, and, and, and some will defend that. But Saussure himself, I have no problem with. I was not familiar with this story at all. So if you look at a lot of recent continental philosophy what seems objectionable in the style, what, what I find hard to read, I've been trying to trace sort of where this goes back to. And I know some of it is in Levinas, who talks about the other, with, you know, a capital O. And some of it is back to Heidegger and folks that we've read already. But Saussure gets a lot of this as well. And he's not somebody that was even offered to me as an option in grad school, because it seems like this particular strain, like I, I listened to part of a uh, iTunes U lecture series from uh, Yale to prep for this, a couple lectures by an English prof. I'll link to this on the website. It's just part of a criticism of literature, right? So it seems a lot of uh, people that are not in philosophy read this stuff. And postmodernism had a relatively short, at least by the time we got to grad school, it was already like very much coming out of favor. But in other departments, this stuff is still very top of mind. Yes, yeah, sociology departments as well. Oh, yeah. When I was getting my master's of fine arts and poetry, I had to read all this almost in every class. That's how I became familiar with it actually, was just having to go through and read all the continental philosophers as if it was literary criticism. And that includes Lacan and people who really aren't doing anything related to literary criticism. So they just get used that way. Right. Dylan, did you have any of this stuff? I'd read some Derrida in undergrad, but never read any Saussure, or never even heard of the guy. Yeah. Well, I mean, Derrida sort of has a wide enough scope that any overview philosophy course, you should do hopefully some Derrida, or at least he gets a mention, even if only to be dismissed as a fad or something like that. But, and this is not, should not be considered sort of the Derrida episode. We're not going to talk about deconstruction. This is really just about this particular story where Saussure is just a linguist. And in fact, he's not even, from what I read on Wikipedia anyway, his approach to linguistics has largely been discredited itself, that Chomsky and people following Chomsky just think that it's not an adequate system for dealing with the whole of what you want to do with linguistics. But I know almost nothing about that. This certainly had no overlap with what I had in my undergrad linguistics course. But in any case, just the idea of the relationship between thought and language or something that he came up with, extremely influential and got generalized by guys like Levi Strauss into this thing called structuralism, which then apparently was very hip for about two years. And then this exact uh, Jacques Derrida essay, he actually presented at a conference in 1966 in Baltimore that was supposed to sort of coronate Levi Strauss. And Levi Strauss was, was at it. And even though this essay seems like a lot of it, I mean, it's talking about Levi Strauss and he's even quotes Levi Strauss a lot to make his own points, but it was perceived and sort of historically it came down to as the dethroning of the <laughs> Levi Strauss and the structuralist, uh, strictly structuralist approach, right? Yeah, it was sort of a big flip because this conference at Jump Tompkins was supposed to bring it all together. It was really the first introduction to structuralism in the United States in a big way. And when it happened, this essay just sort of blew it out of water as soon as it began. Structuralism actually really comes back into importance in American continental theory through Marxism, because you have a lot of French Marxists who are highly influenced by structuralism as a sort of counter tradition to postmodernism, but it pretty much started dead in the water in the United States. Mm -hmm. And yes, linguistically, it's sort of discredited for two reasons. One is Chomsky's natural grammar, and the other is the idea that the structure of language produces thought itself has largely been abandoned. There's a Stephen Pinker 
Baker book about it, which is itself controversial, but has pretty much the given thing for most linguists I know is that language and thought are not exactly coterminous. And so language does not just generate thought. And Saussure sort of predicated that thought was almost a byproduct of language. We want to make sure that we don't get completely lost in the first of these three texts. So maybe we should give a little more detailed overview of the three and then jump into some of the specifics. I was going to make two pleas along those regards. To the extent that the Derrida is a kind of uh, critique of the Saussure and Levi-Strauss, maybe we could really make sure we try to articulate what they're saying before we try to mm-hmm. say that they're wrong, or at least <laughs> say that Derrida says they're wrong. And then right. as a little bit of a, not an aside, but I don't know enough about the naming convention in the history of philosophy. I'm wondering if in the terms of structuralism that Derek, you've heard of, or maybe you guys have heard of, the way it's used in uh, philosophy of science for like structural realism. I mean, there's things about the way it's used there that resonate with what I hear out of the Saussure, but I didn't know if there was any sort of principle cross-fertilization. You know, I actually looked a little bit at structural realism just because when I was doing secondary literature research for this. Do you want to say what that is in philosophy of science? Well, I mean, it's going to be a lot like the Saussure in that you're going to say that what you find out are differences in relations in the world. But the big deal is that you're going to say that those differences that you find, even if you call them by variety of names, point to something that's real in the world. So it's about the status of scientific objects or really models. So when we talk about an atom, for instance, the question is, do we naively think there's such a thing that looks just like the atom? And of course not. But that doesn't lead us to a complete skepticism about entities called atoms. We just think of them as having, it's the structural, it's the relations that they provide us with that we can think of as real, regardless of, is that the... Yes, and, that's the best way of putting it, but it's yeah. And so, what you come down to is trying to, rather than getting in a conflict about whether or not atoms actually exist, you insist that your scientific enterprise does get at the world and at real things, and that you learn real things about the world. And what you end up saying is, you learn some structural things, so to speak. Yeah. So whatever you know, the terms of the relations end up being or looking like, if that's even meaningful, we know that the relations are something of which we have knowledge. The yes. terms of those relations could vary as we like, but it's that structural thing. It's those relationships that are the constant thing that we gain knowledge of. Yes. And it's out of there that you would begin speaking about things like meaning. And the controversies are going to be things like whether your terminology refers or not and what it refers to exactly. And I, you know, I see hints of that in here between the Saussure and the Levi-Strauss, the way Levi-Strauss does the analysis of the mythology and uses that to say, well, the structure that's there, the thing that's real that you learn that's true and eternal, maybe that's saying it too strongly, comes out of that structural analysis and the kind of comparative difference. Yeah, I think it's related because the value of signs is going to depend on every other sign within the system, right? Yeah. So it's largely relational. or That's not exactly accurate the way I put it, actually, because he does end up saying that there's a positive. But maybe we should back up and, yeah. and let's get at his basic theory. I think, I mean, you gave the key point in characterizing his system. What he's reacting to is that linguists before him were just looking seemingly at historical changes in language, right? Looking how Latin relates to French and trying to say things about that. So his big critique, Saussure's, and this 1916 book was actually put together after his death by a bunch of his students. So it's actually just their lecture notes on him. And he was preaching that people should draw a very sharp distinction between this history of the language, which he called what, a diachronic explanation? Yeah, diachronic explanation or parole. Yeah. And then uh, a synchronic explanation, which is looking at just an analysis of the language at a time. You can think of, all right, well, if we're going to forget about how the language got this way, well, we could look at the parts of speech as we use them now. We could look at the syntax in this particular language at this particular time. What is the subject verb ordering and stuff like that? So there's a lot of things that should strike us as not that strange. I mean, can you can you characterize before we sort of give what's philosophically weird about this? What else, Derek? It seems like you're more familiar with this book as a whole. There's a lot of interesting stuff in it when you really dig into it. 
Particularly the idea that if you follow this out, that thoughts are actually a product of particular structures outside of time. And other thinkers do more with this philosophically, because Saussure wasn't really concerned about philosophy. If anything, actually, he was sort of opposed to it. He wanted to sort of deontologize and de-epistemologize the discussion of language, as well as sort of, you know, make it more than just the study of etymology or whatever. People like Althusser and Levi Strauss sort of run with that, and you see them talking about ahistorical structures and histories without subjects and stuff. So it has some pretty big implications. But I don't think Saussure actually thought of his system that way. I think he was just primarily concerned with figuring out what a sign and signifier was. Yeah. That's a much more complicated question than it seems. We should say what signifier and signified are and why he's making that distinction. One of his motivations for doing this is he's objecting to the idea that it's sort of a common sense idea of language where we have a bunch of words and we came up with those words because there are a bunch of things in the world that we need to name. So that's precisely what he's objecting to. First of all, we don't get the simple relationship between a word and a thing, right? We come up with this new way of thinking about what a sign is. Yeah. A sign is this, consists of a a signifier and signified, where the signifier is what he calls a sound image, and then the signified is a concept, basically. Right. So the signifier, the sound tree. The signifier isn't just the particular sound any person makes when they say tree. That's why he calls it sound image, right? Tree is something that sounds slightly different every time I say it. And of course, it'll vary across regional dialects. It's not that actual instance. So you want to think of that as sort of a schema. Whatever schema allows us to hear the same thing anytime someone says tree in an infinite number of different ways, that's the sound image and that's the signifier. And that mm-hmm. signifies this concept, and together they make up the sign, the thing with a meaning. Right. So you have the sound image and the um, signified, which is a concept. But the concept isn't quite even necessarily the concept of the thing. For example, you can think about the way the term tree may change. So we might talk about a tree as a living thing made of wood outside, or we might talk about a tree as a conceptual map that has branches. And we know that in language through context somehow. And there is a relationship there. The signify-signified relationship is not arbitrary. But as to exactly how that holds together, it's not entirely clear. Yeah, it's arbitrary in the sense that We can use any sound we want. Right. Well, in one sense, we can use any sound we want, right, to designate the concept or to signify the concept tree. On the other hand, we can't. If we really want to communicate with others, we're bound by these conventions. So it's arbitrary on a grand scale, but it's not arbitrary for any particular speaker. Yeah, it's not arbitrary in the instance. It's arbitrary in the origination. Yeah, he talks about this in Chapter 2 of Part 1 a lot, in variability and variability of the sign. When I was reading it, I kept on making a note to myself about evolution, and then he started using the word evolution all the time and very explicitly. And it reminded me almost exactly of the problem of speciation and inheritance. Yeah, The invariability has to do with this kind of inheritance that goes from one thing to the other, but there's an arbitrariness about what exactly that is. And then over time, it can change subtly, and you might only see that difference in biological evolution, it might be over many, many generations that you see that, oh, actually, human beings and trees are just distant cousins. That's the implication of Darwin, right? I mean, forget the apes, right? (laughs) Yeah, so where the arbitrariness corresponds to mutation. Exactly. Yeah, but that would all be diachronic discussion of language. Like, you have to deal with that, but it's also trying to move away from that because he seems to profoundly think that this misses a lot of the way that language actually functions and how we use it. Because I can talk about the relationship between, say, anima, animus, animal, all relating back to Latin. And so the animus would be the anger I feel, the anima would be what animates me, and the animal will be an animated thing. And we can all see that diachronically, but we're still missing something about the way language is actually functioning. And that would be his primary point. Yeah, so which is to say there's this system, there's the level of 
and I'm not sure what the pronunciation is. Is it langue? Lang or lang? There's lang, langue, and poro. So, like, lang is the structure, syntax, yeah. semiotics. Poro is, like, the evolution of language, or the relationship of languages. And langue, uh, uh, French speakers are going to kill me. But langue is, like, human speech in the instance of using it. So, like, me talking right now. So you have that sort of tripartite distinction. And langue is not really important. I thought that was parole. See, I had, yeah, yeah. parole. The big distinction is parole and lang. Yeah, where parole is the everyday, the actual speech of human beings. And then there's a sort of a middle level of languages, right? There's English as a language, French as a language, and then lang, if that's the correct pronunciation. Yeah. Spelled langue. Uh, is it langue? <laughs> that's the spelling. I'm just telling the <laughs> listeners. I don't know, should have looked this up, but it's uh is the most general level where you're talking about what language is in general, and it's the system of language, and it's something that sort of is common to all different languages, all the different instances of language, and and so that's the proper that's what linguistics is is actually studying. This very general level. That's what you're saying, Derek, with going against the diachronic, where you're not just documenting historical changes, but you're you're looking at what language is at this very abstract level. Right. I know. I, th I think, though, it has to be referred to a specific language. What I got out of Wikipedia for langue versus parole was langue referring to the abstract system of language that is internalized by a given speech community. It's not language overall in general by everyone, the deep structure of it. It's the structure of this particular language at this time, which is the thing that he's talking about in this book. Right. Well, that's actually, I think, one of the things that distinguishes Sosia from Chomsky. And for example, is Chomsky talks about like universal language structures and Sosia just doesn't really think those exist. He thinks that all languages would be like syntax of specific instances of specific communities. Right. He seems to want to get rid of or downplay any kind of teleological notion at all that would go along with a study of linguistics. And the idea would be that there's nothing about our language that is going towards anything in particular. Correct. As opposed to somebody who says our language reveals something about its deep origins in itself, that it points back towards some authentic beginning of different kinds. I'm kind of explicitly using a similar kind of discussion and critique that you have of biological evolution about, on the one hand, there's nothing about our speciation that points back towards anything natural in their kinds. Those kinds develop, those kinds are differences, but they aren't anything natural. And it seems to me Saussure would be of that bent. And that would be something like what he means by the arbitrariness of our language. It's founded on difference, yes. Those differences aren't rooted in any natural cleavings of the world. So the way I was taught this is he was trying to deontologize the study of yeah. language. Yes. I don't want to get deep into kind of criticism of that right away, but those differences, while arbitrary, the question will be to the extent to which they're real and which they point to something actual and provide meaning and purchase on the world. So it might be the case that there's something arbitrary about the way in which you separate a tree out from the ground. But it's another question altogether to say that once done, that you've not pointed to anything that's to an actual object, for instance. I think he's actually bracketing that out. The question of the extent to which the real world, whatever that is, is affecting the way the sort of stream of sound and then the conceptual stream that he describes them, the way they get carved up into signs through difference, right, at least on each level signs become positive things in themselves with a level signifier and signified each thing has its value simply through its differential relation to other signifiers and other signifieds and that does sound like and i think in the, the way that susser is used that'll end up seeming as if it implies a kind of relativism because he's of course he's not even talking about objects right the signified is the concept and it seems as if there's just some sort of arbitrary carving up into signs without regard to whether or not there are natural kinds in the world to which signs are related in some way. 
Although the one thing that he's, I think, certain of is that language isn't simply a system of words that have come about as a way of naming obvious entities in the world. Those entities aren't entities as such until there's a system of language. And the ability to conceptualize those things comes about with language and with a system of differences. They're not simply there beforehand and then language is overlaid on top of it. But that doesn't imply that the world couldn't play a role in the development of this system of differences. Now, I think people who make use of Sasur, some of them will take the relativist line and will say there is no world, let's say, outside of the text, or that it is a completely arbitrary, in the second sense of arbitrary, development. Right. Well, this is where it's important to just remind ourselves that Sasur did not remotely see himself as a philosopher, and his influence on philosophy is almost historical accident. Really, all these questions for him were just methodological. Right. Well, he is talking about thought. So I, I have the quote here. It's uh, This is in part two, chapter four, section one there, second paragraph, linguistic value. Psychologically, setting aside its expression in words, our thought is simply a vague, shapeless mass. Philosophers and linguists have always agreed that if it were not for signs, we should be incapable of differentiating any two ideas in a clear and constant way. In itself, thought is like a swirling cloud where no shape is intrinsically determinate. No ideas are established in advance, and nothing is distinct before the introduction of linguistic structure. So that's the key point. And then he goes on to say the same thing is true of sound. So it's not like what is going to count as a word. And you could have whistles. You could have multi-syllable thing all be one word. You could have – think of when people try to create alien languages in movies and things. Like that series of clicks and whistles and beeps that R2-D2 or whatever is making. You know, which are the words in there? Yeah, listen to a foreign language and try and – say, what are the phonological units in that? And it's difficult. So you have this stream A and B, and they're each this amorphous stream. And it's only in getting paired up with each other that you actually get units, which I think is an ingenious idea. He's also saying that the very making of the unit is arbitrary, right? Well, I think he's bracketing that question, actually. I think that he might want to bracket it, but he's clearly at least talking about it even if he doesn't want to. If you're going to say that about language, you, it's exactly the same thing that you're talking about when you say, I'm going to distinguish the leaf on the tree from the leaf. I'm going to distinguish the leg on the chair from the leg or the grain of sand from the bucket of sand. How do I distinguish, pick out the one unit thing out of the whole? And lo and behold, I'll also look at that one unit thing and I'll find another unit thing. And this becomes really important, I think, when he wants to then talk about simples later and make the case, which I'm very sympathetic to, that there are larger wholes that are unbreakable simples that might have structure within them, like a word that has many syllables in it, but it constitutes its own whole. It's that kind of relation between parts and wholes that has to do with both difference, how I distinguish this from that, as well as I constitute a whole in which I make a cleaving that doesn't have attention to a lower level of this is and that. That has ontological consequences written all over it. I think you can bracket out the ontological here. He's saying what's necessary to meaning and value for a sign, but he's not saying that this is all that's necessary. So he's saying that it's necessary that there's a this deferential system of sounds, but that doesn't rule out the possibility that the dividing up happens because of some relationship to the world that we have. He's not saying that it's necessarily arbitrary or willy-nilly. He's not arguing against Gru and Bleen. Remember that discussion in uh, the Nelson yeah, Goodman paper? Right, so that, right. you know, why is green a natural kind and not green before time T and blue after time T? And that's what I'm calling I the really kind. think he wants to leave that alone. It may be that it's essentially pragmatic slash phenomenological, like an account of what happens and a willingness to say that this is how we make those distinctions. I mean, the way scientific distinctions are made. You make them, and then you revise them later. Yeah, it could end up aligning with pragmatism, actually. I think it does explicitly, actually, although I don't think Saussure deliberately did this. I just think if you look at some of, like, Peirce's linguistic writings, he ends up coming up with very similar concepts. I see where the problem is. It's because of the disposition that ontology somehow means something eternal. Well, he does seem to at least, you're saying that when you have two different meanings for one word, that there's some ontological link between them. Whereas Frege was our representative, Gottlob Frege, for the analytic 
strain in philosophy of language where Saussure is seen as similarly as the, as the father of this continental strain. So go listen to our Frege episode if you haven't done that already. And Frege seemed to have a much more straightforward, when you have a meaning of a word, and clearly you could have different words with the same meanings, and he specifically gives table in French versus table in English. Those have the same meaning, which Saussure actually denies because he, he thinks that the word in a given language... They have the same meaning. They just don't have the same value. They have different values because the surrounding words are not going to be the same. That even though table, you just have to look more closely at the language that maybe we have different words for coffee table and different kinds of table. And maybe French just has table and covers all those things. And so that means that the words have a different value. And it seems for Frege, if there are two different meanings, I think Frege would just say those have different senses. So the same word can have two different senses, and the sense is hooked to a referent, something actually in the world, at least in sort of this ideal world. It doesn't have to be a physical thing. And so those are just different, where it seems like Saussure is going to say, because it's the same word, there's a connection there. And it's not just a matter of the history of the word, because we can't pay attention to that. And that the difference between them is a difference of value. Right. And the value being determined by the surrounding text. Its place in the system is different. There are different words that are associated with it. It'll take place in different kinds of speech acts within the community. It'll actually serve a different, arbor and tree, let's say, will serve somewhat different functions for different linguistic communities. Well, what about tree and tree, though? I'm saying tree meaning the branching thing on a piece of paper where you're sketching out the different... Like a genealogical you know, tree. Branching of, yes, a genealogical tree versus an actual tree in the forest. Yeah, they still have different values because of the surrounding context. I mean, because of the way they differ in the structure. So let's clarify why they don't have different meanings. Well, they do. Well, those, I think, do have different meanings. They're, All right, yeah. so just clarify what's the difference between meaning and value, I guess. They're different signs, um... Oh, so it's the same word, but a different sign. Same uh, signifier. So they're homonyms. The different signified, and so yeah. hence a different sign. It's the same signifier and different signified, and the sign being a totality, anything that changes in that would be a different sign. We should come up with a couple examples, one in which we have two words that have the same meaning but different values, and two words that have different meanings. Well, he gives you mutton and, what is his example? Mutton. And sheep. This is on page 116. Modern French mouton can have the same signification as English sheep, but not the same value, and this for several reasons, particularly because in speaking of a piece of meat ready to be served on the table, English uses mutton and not sheep. The difference in value between sheep and mutton is due to the fact that sheep has beside it a second term, while the French word does not. So you can see that in French... Mouton is performing, let's say, all of the functions that you need two words for in English, and these are words that are connected within the system. So the values are different. The general concept is the same. And I think it's this is a difficult and much debated part of Sasor because meaning and value are obviously intimately related. And arguably, you can say, well, don't the words then have a different meaning? Yeah, I think a, we understand the general, the gist of what he's trying to get at. Which is to say, you can have these words which roughly translate to each other and refer to the same concept in some sense or signify the same concept, but have somewhat different linguistic functions because of where they stand in the system and their relations to other words. Yeah, and if you look at the next example, we'll get, within the same language, all words used to express related ideas limit each other reciprocally. Synonyms, and I'm going to use the English, dread, fear, and be afraid have value only through their opposition. If dread did not exist, all its contents would go to its competitors. Conversely, some yeah. words are enriched through contact with others. The new element introduced, decrepit, results from the coexistence of... This only makes sense in French. So, decrepit only makes sense in decrypt. The value of just any term is accordingly determined by its environment and is impossible to fix even the value of a word signifying sun without first considering its surroundings. So yeah. there you see the other distinction being where something could have the same value but not be the same sign because of a difference in the other end of the totality. Now you're talking about the same value? Because he's talking about different values between 
No, but he explicitly says that dread, fear, and to be afraid have value only through their opposition. So they can have the same value, but may or may not, depending on how they function in a given Senate or structure. So going back to mutton and sheep, same concept, translatable signifiers, but different values. So the sit in the sun example is, is nice. So when you translate a language, just because you can translate sun into its French equivalent doesn't mean it's going to do all the same things functionally and syntactically in French. You're not going to just be able to translate, sit in the sun, take every word, translate it into French, and then have a phrase that makes sense in French. No, it's the heart of the problem of translation, right? Yeah, exactly. Just to clarify this stuff on why he uses the term value here, this is just later on in that same chapter four. He says, values always involve something dissimilar, which can be exchanged for the item whose value is under consideration. So in other words, like, how do we know the value of a penny? Well, what can a penny buy? And similar things which can be compared with the item whose value is under consideration. So we know the value of a penny by comparing it with a nickel. So that's the analogy. And then he says, think about that in terms of words, that there are similar words to any, right? So dread and fear, those are similar words. And then also that you can sort of compare what's the difference between dread and fear. Well, dread is maybe a really big fear or something like that. And then a word can be substituted for something dissimilar, an idea. The way money can be exchanged for bread, yep. the signifier, I wouldn't say word here. I think I've been using it too. It's wrong to say word exactly, but the, the signifier. Well, this is him. I'm quoting him actually, but okay. you're right. He And he's inconsistent and this is, yeah. Right. You can say word for most purposes, but you got to be clear that there are some multi-word phrases that actually stand for one thing. So yeah. we just have to keep that in mind that really we should be saying the signifier. Right? The sound image. We're saying when we say word in those instances is the sound image because word could mean the whole sign. It's the understandable part of the language in a unit and that changes an instance to instance. So, for example, just from the German, all is sausage, uh, all is worst, which by itself doesn't make much sense, but all together means something like whatever. So that's one unit. All is worst is one unit. If you broke it down into smaller units there, you wouldn't understand it. So that has to be fluid. So yeah, the word is not correct. Right. So isn't this, this is a point where he is quite different from somebody like Chomsky, who's focusing on the complexity of language and how we have to have certain genetic or evolutionary dispositions to be able to take something of this complexity in. Whereas it seems most of what Saussure wants to say, and he explicitly brings in these, you know, it doesn't have to be a system of words. It could be any system of signals, right? It could be hand signals. It could be semaphore. It could be whatever. It doesn't have to have a whole grammar. And that still is going to have what he is going to characterize as essential to language, which is this just the sign, which is the signifier plus the signify, the signification. Well, isn't it? I mean, you said something kind of provocative there, Mark, which is it doesn't have to have a grammar. But even on the analysis of the importance of difference, you could have a signifier and a signified that is a kind of brute force naming of something. But the way in which it's going to get anywhere past that kind of mere labeling is going to involve maybe not quite grammar, but something about difference in relation to its parts within the sentence, abstractly speaking, that it's involved with, mm -hmm. as well as its context. And that is going to have, if not a well-developed grammar, it's going to have, again, a kind of implicit contextual carryover that allows it to actually communicate and not be a bunch of just gobbledygook. Right. Doesn't he call it syntagmatic qualities? Yeah. Just the order of the words. It will always have a syntax. It might not have a semantics. That would be how you would separate that out. Yeah. Well, in general, though, it's going to have both uh, syntactical relationships to other signs, the ways in which it can be grammatically used in a well-formed sentence, let's say, and then it will often have semantic relationships to other signs, like, for instance, dread and fear. So you have the two different constraints within the system, the semantic and the syntactical relationship. Yeah. I'm just thinking about the difference if you listen to somebody speaking a language that you really don't know at all. You won't even, as we've said earlier, won't be able to really tell the difference between words or sentences, except really on analogy with the way you do it already. And that might not actually correspond to the way they're actually using their language. And once you start getting one piece of it and 
seeing the context and the relation to other ones, that's the way you're going to both learn it and understand it. Something I'll make this clearer is on page 122. Units and grammatical facts cannot be confused if linguistic signs were not made up of something besides difference. But language being what it is, we shall find nothing simple in it regardless of our approach. Everywhere and always there is the same number of complex equilibrium of terms that mutually condition each other. Putting it in another way, language is a form and not a substance. So, for example, if you don't know the structure of a language, it is literally meaningless to you, according to Sassur. There would be no way to even approach mm -hmm. it. This has um, epistemological implications, actually. But it does bear out, right? You know, one of the reasons you can't figure out what is it, linear B, is because we don't have a Rosetta Stone for it, and we don't have enough of it to relate it to itself to figure out what it means. Right. A lot of code breaking and cryptological work, you might not know what the exact code is, but you rely on the fact that somewhere in its internal relations, you're able mm -hmm. to sort out what it means. This is the same thing with like game theory and stuff. And he, in fact, mentions it about checkers being a game just like language, having its own internal rules that mm -hmm. you can sort out. And the reason why something like you would have a language that you could not sort out would be you don't have enough information about it. Or the other possibility, I guess, is it's just so different than anything you've ever seen that you don't have any way to any purchase on it. Yeah, there could be an extremely complex function that translates one to the other. Yeah, and it might just be too hard to sort out. Yeah. Now, the reason I brought up the no grammar language, I actually had in mind this example that was in the lecture series I mentioned. Actually, Paul Fry was the Yale professor who did that. He talks about as a way of introducing semiotics, just the red light, stop, green light, go, yellow light, you know, that that is a semiotic system in itself. Maybe that's just a way to transition from Saussure to other semiotic systems, because it's not going to have whatever is characteristic of a language for Saussure. It's not just that red and green mean these different things. They're also the sequence in which they're typically, we expect them to be shown, right? We expect the yellow to show up before the red. There's other things built into the convention. But still, you could just have one light. That's enough to tell you. You don't have to have the other expectations to have the meaning conveyed. Or the blinking red light, you come in an area where there's no other light. It just blinks and you know to stop momentarily. Right. So yes, you don't always have to have all of the syntax there. I guess it can be implied, but not utilized. Because we still understand the red and green thing in a relationship to each other. So without a green signal somewhere, even if it's not visible in the light, the red doesn't mean what it means in that example. And I guess you could say the same thing for any other sort of conventional signaling thing, right? We have a certain convention for what an exit sign looks like. So if you saw that sort of lit sign with that orange or whatever, you know, and you're in a foreign country and you see something and it's displaying, you would probably assume it's an exit sign, even though it doesn't say exit. Well, now we're getting at symbols, which is not as uh, non-arbitrary as... Why wouldn't that be arbitrary? I mean, it seems that we have associations with it because of the language and we've seen it in... Well, I'm thinking of an exit sign that if there's a visual marker of some kind on it that looks like what it's representing that's symbol rather than signifier so like the fact that an exit sign in most countries is the same geometric shape regardless of the language on it not just that because that's still at the level of signifier it's arbitrary but i sorry i may be missing now i'm trying to think of what an exit sign actually looks like <laughs> and whether there's a visual like a stop sign. symbol like a uh are like a person crossing the road where you see a little stick figure. That's, that's a symbol. Better. Yeah, well, that's a better example. The question of what's arbitrary and non-arbitrary becomes complex. It's an easy example when you have a stick figure that actually looks like what you're trying to say. And that, and that becomes symbol and is not simply a completely arbitrary signifier. He talks about that in terms of language, too. Yeah, so onomatopoeia. He talks about, and right, and his response to that like animal sounds, that even in different languages, you have different, you have cock-a-doodle-doo versus ki ki mm -hmm. like those, it's a conventional way that we interpret the natural world. And it's the same thing, like if you showed what might be an obvious, like kids are crossing here kind of sign where you have a picture of persons crossing the road or something, and you showed that to somebody who's just in a savage land that's not familiar with signs or roads or any of that, like, it's not going to make any sense. They're not even going to necessarily recognize a stick figure as representing a person. That, too, is conventional. 
just all symbols are going to, even if they have some sort of, a, they're non-arbitrary. So sir will actually make a distinction between symbol and signifier. It's not that everything ends up being arbitrary. Those are the things that are only semi-arbitrary, right? Like there's still a convention involved, but you can see where they're coming with it. It's, again, it's just like the animal noises. Like you can't say, we say cat say meow and the Spanish say cat say rah, or, you know. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think the main argument with onomatopoeia is that it's not really the way language works in general. Yes, yeah, some words work that way. Well, it isn't one of the big point. I mean, this turns on the question of arbitrary. And it's like any uh, discussion of difference, whether it's in mathematics or in this case, that if you say that the meaning comes out of the difference, it's arbitrary in the sense that where you put down one end of that difference is utterly at will or at random, right? Uh, yeah, okay. I think we're using arbitrary in two different ways here. There's the arbitrariness of saying that different sounds can signify the same concept. We can choose any sound we want to signify the same. That's arbitrary. And then there's the second level arbitrariness, the question of we can divide the world up in different ways and we can have different systems where pairs of signifier signified these signs with the same concepts have different kinds of relationships with other signs in different languages. And so there's an arbitrariness to the way we're carving up the world, or there's an arbitrariness to value, let's say. So those are two different ways of using this word arbitrary. Yeah. And the arbitrariness of the sounds is going to become quickly constrained by the structure of the language, right? So as you accumulate more and more and you have the context of them related to one another, it's become more and more difficult to have the sounds be utterly arbitrary. In the example that Mark gave, you're not going to be able to maintain contextual meaning if you are constantly over and over and over again making new words, essentially, by having new sounds. You're going to have to have there be a kind of consistency in order to have it be a language at all. Yes, yeah, so the most arbitrary level for Sasur is the letter. If we're talking about, like, language mm -hmm. in the conventional sense. So, like, T and T, and this is an example he actually uses, is arbitrary. Like, there's no reason why the crossed T and T go together. Now, that's actually not true for every language. Korean, that's not true for, so that can throw it off. But he sort of didn't know that. That was a basic assumption, is that the most basic constituent unit was the most arbitrary. Yeah, and I think, Dylan, what you're getting at is the... Arbitrariness is constrained to the extent that I can't suddenly, within the system, yes, dog could be used to refer to what we normally call horses, except dog is already taken. That's constrained even on a broader level because I can't simply go around. This reminds me of an episode of a sitcom I saw once. I think it Sarah Silverman or something where she tries to invent a new word and then goes around trying to make it infectious so that it will become the new thing, like slang, some sort of slang word or something. And Saussure talks about this. Really, it's impossible. You couldn't legislate usage, for instance. You couldn't make a law and say, okay, from now on, we're going to use the word horse to refer to dogs and use the word dog to refer to horses. It simply wouldn't work. Again, for each individual user of the language, it's non-arbitrary, even though it's changing over time and things do change. It's just that no one particular person or government is going to be able to engineer the way we speak. That's the heart of structuralism, right? Right. The structure produces things, and once the structure's set, you can't really alter it. To use another example from Paul Fry, he talks about in China, supposedly, Madame Mao tried to change the signification of the red light and green light, because red is the symbol for progress in communist China. So they tried to make <laughs> red mean go instead of stop, but it didn't take. <laughs> That's awesome. That's a great example. <laughs> It didn't take. <laughs> surprise, surprise. You know, you can see how you can start applying this in all kinds of metastructural ways, too, which is where this linguistic form of structuralism gets really both interesting and hard to deal with. You can see how much trouble we're having just figuring out the sign. Now, you know, talk about the myth theme, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, that sounds like a good time to move to Levi Strauss. Yes. All right. It took me till the, about the second reading to figure out how this was really connected. Somebody else give a summary of the little essay. It's very short. Called the Structural Study of Myth, which is from uh, Structural Anthropology. He basically tries to set up what he thinks a myth is and to break it from a sort of 
arbitrary notions that it's had in the past. And he uses a similar distinction to long and parole and then adds a third category. He sort of structurally lays out those categories. I mean, that's pretty much all he does in that example when he uses the Oedipus myth as the primary example. He says anthropologists don't talk about myths enough, that they've started to turn away from religion. And so that just leaves it to sort of idiots and lunatics <laughs> describing this. People that try to just say, what's the meaning of myth? And they just make up a bunch of bullshit. Right. Here's a quote. Some claim that human societies merely express through their mythology fundamental feelings common to the whole of mankind, such as love, hate or revenge. Or that they try to provide some explanation for phenomena which they cannot otherwise understand, astronomical, meteorological, and the like. But why should these societies do it in such elaborate and devious ways, when all of them are also acquainted with empirical explanations? On the other hand, psychoanalysts and many anthropologists have shifted the problems away from the natural or cosmological toward the sociological and psychological fields. But then the interpretation becomes too easy. If a given mythology converts prominence on a certain figure, let us say an evil grandmother, it will be claimed that in such a society, grandmothers are actually evil and that mythology reflects the social structure and the social relations. But should the actual data be conflicting, it would be as readily claimed that the purpose of mythology is to provide an outlet for repressed feelings. Whatever the situation, a clever dialectic will always find a way to pretend that a meaning has been found. So that sounds like, yeah, there is room for something else. And so he wants to give this sort of scientific alternative. But then the thing that he comes up with is so bizarre and arbitrary sounding, to me at least. The table in the middle of that paragraph? Yes. <laughs> he tries to give an analysis of the Oedipus myth by saying sort of, what are the themes that are in Oedipus? And he puts them in a table and he comes up with these...